I, uh, my family, uh, well, my, myself and my wife, thank you very much, Cass. Um, myself and my wife, we unfortunately got the COVID bug. So today is my first day in being here in church for about five, uh, for about five, well, I've had five Sundays off, so that's quite a while for, uh, for me. My wife, unfortunately, is still in lockdown. But one of the things I've really appreciated over this past week as we've had COVID is uh, from many of you, there's been some really encouraging messages just asking if we wanted to uh, have anything delivered to our house, if there was anything that, uh, that we needed. Um, praise God, one of the things that is uh, fairly common nowadays is to have... Um, is to have food delivered. And this is something that me and my wife have been making use of uh, throughout, uh, f- for a little while now. Um, for a little while, we've been getting something uh, delivered to our house called HelloFresh. Who here knows what HelloFresh is? Does anyone have any idea? Some people are HelloFresh, some people, other people are not HelloFresh people. It just works for some people, doesn't work for others. Now, if you don't know what HelloFresh is, uh, what it is, is you, um, at the beginning of a week, you might choose the, the meals that you want to have delivered to your house for a certain week, um, and they deliver uh, the, the ingredients for the meals and how you need to put them together. Um, you still have to cook the meals yourself and put it all together, but it's really just saving a little bit of uh, brain power more than anything. Uh, and this is something that my wife and I, as I said, have been making use of for, uh, for a little while. And the reason that we have uh, become HelloFresh people is primarily my fault. Now, when my wife does cooking, she does a great job. She is a wonderful cook. I, on the other hand, am a boring person. Uh, typically, if, I, if we had nothing at home and I needed to pick up dinner, there are two things I will get on the way home from work, which is meat and salad. That is a, uh, is a good meal. But after six years of marriage, my wife was starting to say to me, look, Dave, I don't think this is working for us anymore. I thought it was fine, you know. So on special nights, I would go all out. We would have peas and corn and carrot and gravy. I mean, who, who needs anything more than just meat and, meat and veg, really? <coughs> Unfortunately, uh, this was becoming a, uh, a trend in our, in our household. <coughs> um, and so my wife decided the best thing for us to do is to get this thing called HelloFresh, where we would just choose the meals that we wanted at the beginning of the week. We wouldn't have to think about it too much, and then we would get the ingredients delivered to our, to our door. Now, one of the things that I discovered since getting HelloFresh is that there are more ingredients rather than just meat and salad. In particular, one of the meals that we got recently was a pear and bacon fettuccine. That sounds weird, doesn't it? Like, I looked at that and I saw pear and bacon fettuccine. The problem I found with looking at a pear and bacon fettuccine was I don't really count bacon as a real meat, you know? Like, that's just a side that you have to, uh, to your main thing of meat. And I was like, what's this thing that I have right here? How does pear and bacon go together? And yet, when we put it all together, I cooked this one, by the way, and it mwah, turned out very good. <laughs> now, when we put all of this stuff together, it actually turned out to be quite delicious. Now, who would have thought that these things would have gone to, I would have never thought this a few years ago before we, uh, before we got into this. Um, and this has been the, the trend as we've been uh, making all of these wonderful meals every, uh, every night of the week, throwing in all these different ingredients together and coming up with new things, new flavours that, uh, that I had never experienced before. This morning, what we're going to be doing... We are, as we, uh, we are beginning a new series where we're going to be looking at the flavor of our church. What are the ingredients that make Brackenridge Baptist Church, Brackenridge Baptist Church? What does it taste like to be a part of our church? What does it feel like when people come into this place and, uh, 
and experience community here. And this flavor, that's a word that we'll use uh, probably a little bit throughout this, throughout this series, this flavor is called our values, parts of who we are that are not necessarily unique to us. So none of these values that we're going to be looking at are unique to us um, uh, as a church. But when you put them all together, it creates something unlike any other group of people or any other church that you come into contact with. Our values, um, these are things that many of you who have been around for a while probably won't even recognize or see. They will probably be things that are normal for you if you've been here uh, for a little while, um, and you won't really, uh, you, you won't recognize them. Um, before getting COVID this past week, I, um, I was on holidays for about three and a half weeks. And one of the things I, I often do when I'm on holidays is, uh, is I go and visit um, other churches. And the reason I do this is just to, to be able to sit under the Word of God and just receive things for, uh, for, a, couple of, for a couple of weeks. Um, and the churches I, I visited... Many things that they do would be similar to, to what we do here. They sing worship. They would sing many of the similar songs to, to what we do here. Um, they would share from God's Word. He heard some, some wonderful messages. They would worship again. We would hear about the things happening in the life of the church. Um, and yet, all of the places that I, that I went to over my holidays, even if there's certain things that on paper they seem similar... They didn't feel the same as our church. There were certain things that were different, and you could pr- probably put a few different words to them to describe uh, what was different about them. Every church, they would say that they value things like scripture and prayer and evangelism, etc. But what are the things that are unique to us? What's our flavor? What makes us us? Now, our values, they're not our vision, it's not where we're going, it's not our mission, why we exist, rather it's who we are. And at the end of last year, um, we, uh, we spent a time of, uh, of 21 days of prayer and fasting and also surveying uh, our church to be able to land at a point where we would be able to understand what our values are uh, together, what do we value? What makes us us? And the uh, responses from people in those surveys was pretty outstanding. Uh, was pretty astounding. Sorry, in its consistency, um, being able to discern our values was really, really clear based on the consistency of the responses that we uh, that we saw. And out of those surveys and that pr- time of prayer and discernment, there were five clear values that came out for our church, which is this, that our church values family. We believe that church is more than a place. It's a family where we find our true sense of belonging. At our church, we value grace. Everyone is welcome at our church. No matter what your past, you are welcome with us. At our church, we value diversity. We don't all look the same and we celebrate that. We see beauty in being united and loving in our diversity. At our church, we value authenticity. We believe in being genuine with one another. Church is where we can be our most real and honest selves. And at our church, we value advancement. We believe that the church should be on the move. We won't get complacent or comfortable. We will go wherever God calls us to go. And this is what this series is all about. We're going to be spending five weeks on this, one week on each one of these values. Um, and, uh, and as we, we come to this, some of you may have the question, why do we need to speak about this? What's the point? Why can't these things just operate in the background um, without us spending any time uh, thinking about it? <clears throat> There's a couple of reasons that this is important for us to, uh, to speak about um, as a community. The first one is that when people join our church, and there's been many of you who have come uh, over the past little while and joined our, our church, which is, which is wonderful, but as people join our, our community here um, together, um, as people come here, uh, people come with their, 
with their own understanding of, uh, of what church should look like and with their own values. <coughs> and throughout this series, this is a, a way of us being able to, to communicate to people who are coming through, uh, through our doors for the first time, this is who we are. This is uh, before, before you even come and join our community, you already know this is what our church values and, uh, and what the flavour of our, our church is like. Our values help us put a stake in the ground and say, this is who God has made us to be. We're not perfect, but this is what we value here. And our values also help us to, uh, the, our values also help shape um, what we do as a, as a church. So for example, as a community who values grace, um, whoever comes through our doors is welcome we are not going to hold anyone's past sins against them. Every single person who comes through our doors is, uh, is welcome. As a community who values advancement, we are not going to be a place that uses the line, this is how we have always done it. We are not going to get comfortable in how we have always done things. We are going to do what is necessary to advance the kingdom of God. And the value that we're going to be starting with today is our value of family which is that we believe that church is more than a place, it is a family where we find our true sense of belonging. So if you have your Bibles, uh, what we're going to do as we look at this value of family in our church is turn our Bibles to Ephesians 2, verses uh, 11 to 22. So if you have your Bibles, just turn them there. It'll also be up there uh, on the screen. And it says, therefore, remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves a circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. ...side in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations... His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit." Consequently, and this is a really important verse for us this morning, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people <coughs> and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. A few weeks ago, when we were going through our last series, we just went through a series called Seven Words to the Church Today, where we were looking at the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. And the first church that is discussed throughout those uh, those three chapters, is the church in Ephesus, which is who this letter is being written to from Paul. And we spoke in great detail um, about the fact that the church in Ephesus began really strong. They were doing wonderful things for the kingdom of God. And yet, over time, things began to change a little bit. Things didn't stay where they did right at the start. Now, even though this book of Ephesians is a book of encouragement for the church in Ephesus, this is a point where Paul is pointing out some of the things that aren't going as well in the church anymore. And one of the things that he's addressing throughout this book is the theme of disunity within the church in Ephesus, particularly uh, disunity that had come about between 
uh, Gentile believers and Jewish believers. Both Gentile believers and Jewish believers were now bringing cultural assumptions to the table, and because of their cultural assumptions, there was uh, arguments and infighting that had begun within the church in, uh, in Ephesus. And the primary way that Paul decides that he is going to call this out um, and, uh, and remind them of, uh, of, their, uh, of, of who they are is speaking of their identity in Christ. Paul hammers on this point all throughout the book of, uh, of Ephesians, telling them how their identity has changed now that they are in Christ. And we see this really clearly in what we have just read from verses 11 to 13. Um, Paul speaks specifically to the Gentiles, this is written primarily to the Gentile believers in the church in Ephesus, um, by letting them know that they are no longer separate from God, but they have been brought near because what it Uh, because of what Christ has done, because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, now Gentile believers have been brought near to God. The whole language of verses 11 to 13 is that they have been brought into something that they were not a part of before. And then he goes on, Paul goes on in, uh, in verses 14, and then speaks about how they should... uh, speak to one another and be with one another because they have been brought into, uh, into something new. So in verse 14, um, what Paul begins to speak about is, uh, is peace. Throughout verse 14 and the following verses, this, um, this theme of peace comes through pretty strongly. Um, verse 14, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups... So Jewish believers and Gentile believers, he's made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. There is no longer a wall that needs to be between Jewish and Gentile believers. Now we are one. Now there should be peace amongst believers. There shouldn't be infighting and arguing that happens. Quick side note before we um, look at the following verses from verses 14 to 18. This is one thing that I think um, we should just take a step back from and think about in our modern context because for me when I look at verses like this and the amount of times that unity is spoken about throughout the New Testament, um, this is something that is central to the heart of the apostles and central to the heart of Jesus, that God's church would be a united people. Often throughout the worldwide church today, I think it can be fairly common for the worldwide church to be known more by what we are against rather than what or who we are for. We can get lost in disagreements with one another and somehow think that we are defending God if we hurl abuse at one another. These divisions, I've seen them happen, and I think uh, in one sense they could be even getting worse. These divisions can happen because of denominational differences, political differences, or having differences simply through association. But what we see here... In verse 14 and the following verses, is that the intention of what Christ has done through his life, death, and resurrection, bringing people to himself, is that they, these people who he brings to himself, might have peace with one another. In verse 14, this, this, uh, this theme of peace is, is spoken about uh, from then to the following verses. Verse 14, destroy barriers so that you might have peace. Verse 15, set aside secondary issues to have peace. Verse 16, look to the cross to have peace. Verse 17, proclaim peace. Verse 18, through the Spirit, receive peace. Having peace with one another in the church is an important issue both to Jesus and to Paul. Now, are differences necessary and allowable within the church? Of course. Should we discuss these differences? Of course we can. Is there a line when people 
uh, followers of Jesus and others aren't? Of course there is. But for those who are followers of Jesus, we have been called to peace with one another as we look to Jesus together. From that point, from speaking about the Gentiles being brought Uh, being brought near because of Jesus. And then from verses 14 to 17, speaking about peace with one another as we look to Jesus. Then from verse 19, um, Paul hits his stride. He really helps us understand the point of his argument uh, and and tells us to a new level what the church is supposed to, to be. Because in verses 19 to 22, The language that Paul uses here is unlike anything else that we have seen in Scripture. In other points in Scripture, the the church is called the body of Christ, which is speaking to the gifts of the church. Another point, in other, another point we are be, uh, the church is called the bride of Christ, speaking to the church's relationship with Christ. But here, he calls us a family, a household, because of Jesus. This is not um, Paul referencing our, uh, who we are in our identity with Jesus, although he has already pointed to that in previous verses. By speaking about us as a household, as a family, he's speaking to our relationships with one another. In verse 19, you are no longer foreigners and strangers. But you, and we can hear this for us this morning as well, you are fellow citizens with God's people and you are members of his household. We, today, 2,000 years later, we have been invited into a family. We have been invited into God's household where Jesus is the head of the house. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. It's far more attractive than looking at my hanky that I've, uh, that I've had sitting in my, my pocket. Thank you, Winston. <laughs> Paul's way of, um, of telling the Ephesians to get over their arguments with one another is by telling them that their new identity in Christ means that they are part of the same household. They are now a family. Let me just go to the next slide. Thank you, Lynn. <coughs> There is some great stuff in following verses in, uh, in verses 20 to 22. It speaks about Jesus being the cornerstone, very well-known passage. Um, this family is now being built on, on Scripture. Um, we see later as well in, verse, in the final verse that we rise together by the Spirit of God. So in the following verses from verse 20 to 22, there are great content there. Um, but we are not going to focus on that at the moment because there is something important here for us today, I think, in verse 19. You are no longer foreigners and strangers, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and also members or of his household. Or in our language, how we are saying it today, we believe that church is more than a place. It is a family where we find our true sense of belonging. There are no strangers or outcasts in our church. Only family. Why? Because Jesus in his infinite love for us, poured out his blood on the cross and three days later rose again so that we would be brought into his family where we can have relationship with him and have relationship with others. When I use this word of, <coughs> of family or being invited into a, into a household is the, is the language that Paul uses here, um, many of you will have different Um, different thoughts about what this looks like. Some of you may have had great families. Some of you may have had very difficult families. Most of us have a uh, a blend of the the two. Um, And uh, and one of the things that I think we can um, take away from, uh, from just understanding this idea of family that Paul speaks about here is... um, is that although we get to choose which church we we go to, um, we don't get to choose who might join us and uh, and be a part of our family. In the same way, we don't get to choose which family we are a part of. Um, Now, families can be uh, pretty pretty messy. Um, 
Uh, a few weeks ago, or a couple of months ago now, my brother came and, and shared from, uh, from God's Word here and, uh, and was speaking about the work that he is doing overseas. Um, and I was really encouraged by, by that. Many of you came to me afterwards and said, oh, your brother seems really great, really godly guy. Um, I don't think so as much as, uh, as some of you do. Um, for me, he's just Chris, my brother, who tortured me as a, uh, as a child, don't worry, it wasn't really that bad. <laughs> but I'm not going to tell you one example of, what our fa- of the messiness of our family. I'm not going to tell you two examples. I'm going to tell you five examples this morning of, uh, of my experiences in a, uh, in a messy family. First one, remember my brother who came here, shared faithfully from God's word, and uh, just think about him as you, uh, as you hear these things. First one, when, my, when I was about three years old, my brother thought it would be a, a great idea to train me for the Olympics. And what he did is he wrapped a rope around me and he ran me around the backyard to train me for the Olympics so that I would be a, uh, a fit little three-year-old for the Junior Olympics. Another example of what my brother did to me once. He shoved me in the wheelie bin at home and he, we had a very, very steep driveway. He decided it would be fun to, probably about three years old again, shove me in the wheelie bin, rolled me down the driveway. Third example. My brother, uh, the, the trusting person that I was, my brother told me that he was going to tie me to a pole, but very soon after, he was going to, to let me go from this. He tied me to the pole, and he never let me go. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, my trusting nature may just be uh, actually just a gullible nature, really, because on another occasion at, uh, at Birkdale Baptist Church, after church one day, my brother decided to lock me in the boot of the car, and he said, don't worry, I'll let you go in about five minutes. He didn't come back. <laughs> so I was stuck there in the boot of, my, of this car again. And then the final time I just want to share with you this morning is uh, my brother thought it would be uh, a good thing one day to come into my room when I wasn't there, move every single thing that I owned, and put shaving cream on about half of my possessions. <laughs> I don't know where he gets these things from, my goodness. <laughs> now, families, they can be pretty messy. <laughs> don't worry, me and my brother get along very well, right? <laughs> Nowadays. <laughs> but families, they can be pretty messy, and... Uh, and this is true for every, every single family. Um, and sometimes our family, our church family, can be a little bit messy as well. We're not always going to be perfect to or with one, one another. We're all, not always going to get it right with one another. But we will, in Paul's words, do what we can to seek peace with one another because that is what Jesus has done for us. He has taken us from being strangers and brought us into a household with one another. We believe that church is more than a place. It is a family where we find our true sense of belonging. And I have seen this value. I've seen family lived out in so many different ways at this church, throughout this community here. I love that this is something that you value here at our, at our church. I've seen many of you invest into other people like they are your own sons or daughters or your own brothers or sisters. I've never seen anyone tie, their, tie anyone to a pole and leave them there. I see relationships at this church that are far closer than just being co-members, but family. One example of this is what I shared with you earlier. I was just so encouraged and blessed this past week by the amount of messages and phone calls and, uh, and questions about just asking if anyone was able to serve us. I was just so blessed by that this, uh, this, past, um, this past week. So to finish our, our time together as we understand this, uh, this value of family, I just want to share with you four things that I see from God's Word that speak to this, um, this idea of family that is presented in Ephesians first one that we see really clearly here from, um, from the passage in, in Ephesians is family is best when it is unified. 
the whole point of Paul's message uh, in, the, in the first few verses is, uh, throughout this book, sorry, is to stop the infighting, stop the uh, silly arguments amongst yourselves. We don't want to be one of these families who, uh, who gets anxious about Christmas lunches together. We want to have joy as we come together and experience community with each other. There is strength in, un- uh, in unity and family is best when it is unified. Second thing I just want to share <coughs> from, a, from elsewhere in Scripture is family is better in person. Hebrews 10 verse 25 Do not give up meeting together, as some of you are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, I praise God for things like church online. I praise God that we have um, different ways that we can connect with people who aren't able to be here in person. I just want to let you know, if you aren't comfortable being here in person, please feel free to join with us online. Um, But I genuinely believe that community and family is done better when we are able to gather in person rather than gathering online. Um, Online is a useful thing for us and we are going to continue having online church available. (coughs) But I genuinely believe that family is done better in person. My brother and sister live a, a fair distance away from uh, from, um, from us here in Brisbane, and although m- catching up with them on Zoom is fantastic, it doesn't compare with having a coffee or having dinner with them in person, and I genuinely believe that family as a church is better in person as well. Family is best when everyone is involved. Family is best when everyone is involved. If you have come here recently and have joined our, uh, our church family here, and maybe you haven't really felt a part of things yet, maybe you haven't really felt like you've been involved or included in, in certain things, um, firstly, I just want to say sorry for that, if that's been the, the case for you. Um, but secondly, I just encourage you as well to, to maybe take a step and think and pray about what you can do to be a part of our family here. And the fourth application for our time this morning um, is that family is best when we welcome others home. If it's your first time today, or you've only been coming for a, for a few weeks, um, what I would just want to say to you is welcome home. Welcome to our family. We want to embrace you and love you with grace uh, and open arms however we can. Um, I just think it would be great right now if church, if we can just, um, can we just acknowledge and welcome anyone who is here for the first time to our family. Can we just welcome them, please? You are genuinely welcome here and we do pray that you will find family here at our uh, in our church. And one of the ways that you can do that is by coming to our newcomers morning tea after the service out um, through those doors just over there. So right now, just as the team comes up, I just invite you to stand. I'm going to pray in a minute. You can stand to your feet right now. And what we're going to do is we're going to sing to God together. We have brought, been brought into uh, relationship with Jesus. Yes, we have a vertical relationship, but we also have relationship with one another, been invited into Christ's household because of what he has done for us. As we come and as we we worship um, Jesus right now, um, in our society, we can be fairly individualistic and we can think of just ourselves. Um, But as we worship here together, we are doing this as a group. We are doing this as God's church together lifting up the name of Jesus as a family, um, wanting to acknowledge him as king. So let's join together our voices as we lift up the name above all names. Let's just pray together. Lord, as we, um, as we uh, come before you in worship right now and as we um, sing to you, Lord, help us to be thoughtful and aware of the of the people around us that you've given us give us real joy 
in our family here. Thank you that we've been invited individually into relationship with you, but also that we've been invited into a household where now we can find home. And Lord, I just really want to pray for, uh, for anyone this morning who may have had a bad experience of what family means. They may have not understood what that, um, what that should have looked like. And Lord, I pray that this will be a family where people will feel safe, will feel blessed, will feel encouraged. And that we will be a community that genuinely does life together. Lord, I just really want to thank you for the way that you work in, uh, in our community here in this, uh, in this place. For the way that you've been working for, for many, many years. And help us to... Um, to both experience family together, but also welcome others into, into this group. We want to be people who have uh, open arms to welcome people into your family. <laughs> it is your family, King Jesus. We, we acknowledge that, that you are the head of this household. You are the head and the king over all of us. And so we acknowledge you as that in Jesus' name. Amen.